ask a couple questions here. Um, first of all, maybe you could tell everybody what you do for a living. Yes, I'm a seismologist. I work uh, with the Cascades Volcano Observatory. I work with the U.S. Geological Survey. And uh, the job of a seismologist at a volcano observatory is to interpret the si signals that are coming at us from uh, the seismometers we have at the volcanoes um, and make determinations about whether there's uh, something happening at the volcano or um, a much more likely uh, event uh, that nothing is happening at the volcano. So you're a scientist. How did you become interested in science? Well, um, when I was four or five, uh, I was interested in volcanoes and earthquakes and dinosaurs, and um, that kind of stayed there. Uh, I didn't. I lost the dinosaurs, but not the volcanoes and earthquakes. <laughs> And um, I was also interested in, in music, um, was interested in uh, computers and environmental science, and didn't really start settling down the path of science until I got to college. I tried a couple of different uh, courses and uh, took a geology course, and that really captured my fancy and, and uh, continued from there. What do you like about science? Well, science is a really great philosophy to live life by. It's a testable hypothesis way of looking at life. It's a requiring that you can reproduce things that uh, you believe um, are, are to be the cause of something that you see. And um, if you follow the scientific method, you're not gonna go wrong in many directions. <laughs> Excellent, I like that. Well, should we get going with the presentation? Sure. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen here and we'll bring up the PowerPoint presentation. You should be able to still see um, see us or, or Seth uh, in the corner of your screen there. There we go. Okay, well, um, welcome everybody. And um, we're just gonna get going right here. Um, so you are all now volcano seismologists. And the reason why you're a volcano seismologist is because you've just shown up to work and uh, you just noticed that there is a swarm of earthquakes occurring at, at Mount Red Sox and you are the first person to show up at the building. So you are alone. You are by yourself. And the media are calling and they want to know what's going on because they can see those earthquakes on your web page. So a little bit of background. Um, you notice that the earthquake started occurring about two o'clock this morning, so they've been going for about six hours by now. The earthquakes are all pretty small, magnitude less than one, but you notice that the earthquake rate, that is the rate of earthquakes occurring uh, in any given like hour, has increased over the last uh, little bit of time. Um, and then you also remember from talking with some people in the hallway that Mount Red Sox has had swarms in its past. So they're not uncommon. So with that as your background, um, this is actually what you're seeing on the screen. And um, I'm not sure if I, oh, there we go. There's a little, little pointer here. This is what we call a web recorder. This shows continuous seismic data. You read this like a book, uh, top to bottom and left to right. Uh, each line represents an hour's worth of time. And each of these little marks in here is an earthquake. And so indicated here the start of the swarm at Mount Red Sox, two o'clock in the morning, there are the first little earthquakes. And then as you go in time, the number of earthquakes are slowly increasing in time. It's not a linear thing. There are some bursts, like over here, there's a little burst, and there's over uh, an hour later, there's not much happening. But over the space of the last couple of hours, earthquakes have definitely increased. So that's what you see when you walk in the building and the media is asking you for an interpretation. And so uh, we're going to start off with the poll, the very first poll, which is, uh, what, is what, do, what do you think is going on here? And so we're going to switch over now to the poll. And uh, there are five choices. Um, the first is that um, this is a, a harmless swarm, which is nothing to get excited about. Um, the second is uh, there's not an eruption that's likely. Um, but it's possible one could happen in a couple of weeks. The uh, third possibility is a small eruption is likely within the next few days. Fourth possibility is a large eruption is likely within the next few days. And the fifth is an eruption is happening now. So why don't you uh, uh, just think about that for um, a minute and cast your vote, and then we'll continue on.
All right, looks like why are we showing up here? We, most people seem to think uh, it's harmless swarm, nothing to get excited about. Oh, now that's neck and neck with no eruption is likely soon. Oh, that's taken over now. 13 folks voting so far, 13 classes voting. All right. Okay, we'll go, we'll go for another uh, 10, 15 seconds. Sounds good. Get your votes in now. All right. All right, we're going to close the poll. Okay, let's uh, bring back the presentation. Let's see here. It's about 50-50. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I apologize for starting off. Uh, with a um, uh, a question for which you probably had very little background uh, for, but there there are the options. We're going to come back to this poll um, as we play out this scenario throughout the rest of of this presentation. But now it's time to give you a little bit of background, um, so that the next time you're confronted with something like this, um, you you might have uh, a little more confidence in your ability to select the right letter out of that or the right option. So the job of a volcano seismologist, I already mentioned this uh, um, when Ray asked, uh, is to correctly interpret seismic signals from volcanoes. And we do this by using seismometers. And this is a, a picture that shows three different You can see that they range from small to pretty, si pretty sizable. The uh, seismometer that's yellow is about the size of a nine volt battery. And uh, the ones on the right hand side are about uh, maybe a foot and a half, two feet tall. Um, they get buried in the ground. Um, often inelegantly like this in a five gallon bucket, um, sometimes in much more elaborate uh, el elaborate scenarios. And uh, they're sitting out there and they're recording the vibrations in the earth um, and any kind of, of thing that makes the earth move, they record. They're very, very sensitive instruments. And uh, they are, most of them, most of the time are transmitting signals to us in real time. So we can, uh, from the comforts of our offices, determine or, or, or see what's going on uh, in the seismic world out and about. Um, so with this data, the job of the volcano seismologist, actually the job of an observatory scientist, is to make the, rec the right call about whether or not something is likely to happen. And along with that, make the right call about what is likely to happen. What being, is it going to be an explosion? Is it going to be a small eruption? Is it going to be a large eruption? Those kinds of things. And again, this is not just the seismologist role. There's other parts to the puzzle. There's um, deformation, there's gas, there's geology. Um, all those things pa uh, factor in. Um, and one thing we all keep in mind is that false alarms are, are not a good thing. And the, the, the collective experience is that once you alarm, uh, send an alarm and say trigger an evacuation, after you've done that a time or two, people are much less willing to evacuate. And so the chances of them uh, not evacuating when they actually need to go up. So there's a really tight wire that to walk uh, when pronouncing or inter providing interpretations and pronouncements about what you think is going to happen. So um, what are the kinds of signals that we see at volcanoes? I'm going to run through uh, a sampling of them, starting with uh, what I'll call a garden variety earthquake. This is a regional remote earthquake that was located about 40 miles away from this seismometer. Um, and uh, this oops, wrong button, there we go, um, has a, uh, a very characteristic onset of the P wave and the S wave arrival. And you, some of you may have heard of those. Uh, the P wave is called the P because it arrives first. It's the primary wave. And then the S wave is called S because it arrives second, secondary wave. And this is just like thunder and lightning. The P wave is like the lightning. The S wave is like the thunder. And some of you may know that if you t count the number of seconds between when you see the lightning and hear the thunder, you can make a guess about how far away the lightning was. You can do the exact same thing with the earthquake. Um, so in this case, the difference between the P and the S wave is about 10 seconds. That's actually about 40 miles away. Um, that's what you should get, that kind of separation. So this kind of earthquake, when you see it, uh, you know what's happened at the source. You know what's happened to cause it. It's rock breaking. And this is the kind of thing that's happening uh, all around the, 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 uh, the Pacific Rim. Um, the Ring of Fire, it's happening down in California, it's happening in Alaska. Uh, all the time, uh, there are earthquakes being created, small and large, uh, mostly small around the Earth. At the volcano, uh, we also get local earthquakes, and 
this looks different from what I showed you before. It looks different because the P and the S are happening right on top of each other. There's no time for the separation to occur. It's basically PS. And uh, so this earthquake was located about a mile away from this sensor. Um, and at volcanoes, these come in two flavors. There's what we call the volcano tectonic earthquake, which is just like a tectonic earthquake. It's rock breaking. It's a normal earthquake. We call it volcano tectonic because we don't necessarily know if it's because there's something happening at the volcano like magma coming in, or it could just be a tectonic earthquake right next to the volcano. Um, so that, that's, a, that's terminology. Um, the other kind of thing we see is something we call low frequency earthquake. And uh, we call it low frequency because the appearance is different uh, between the volcano tectonic and the low frequency. The low frequency earthquake has more space between each peak. So there's fewer uh, ups and downs over say a second for a low frequency earthquake than a high frequency earthquake. And that just gets into sort of physics of waves and how you describe waves. This would be called a low frequency waveform because there's fewer peaks. Um, and when you see this kind of an earthquake at a volcano, first off, this is low frequency earthquakes are really only seen at volcanoes, sometimes glaciers too, but you don't see them in California um, in, in big faults. Um, and at volcanoes, what we commonly think when we see these is that we have some kind of fluid filled crack that's vibrating. And the crack could be filled with water, it could be filled with gas, it could be filled with magma or some combination of those. But that's a very common interpretation. And part of the reason for that interpretation is that commonly low frequency earthquakes are seen in association with eruptions or with the, in association with the last stages of unrest leading to an eruption. Another class of signal that we see at volcanoes is uh, what we call seismic tremor. Um, tremor is basically just constant shaking of the ground that lasts for a long time. In this case, I'm showing an example that lasted for 50 minutes. And um, tremor at volcanoes uh, is commonly thought to um, represent the flow of fluid, somewhat like low frequency earthquakes, uh, water, magma gas through cracks. It's also seen during explosions. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that an explosion is happening or that a volcano is going to erupt, but very commonly you see tremor when a volcano is restless and getting ready to erupt. We also see signals from rock falls and avalanches. This is a two minute long uh, signal from a rock fall at Mount St. Helens. And uh, this is what rock fall looks like on this is Mount St. Helens. And for scale, there's a road down here to the river um, that got buried by the rock fall. Um, these commonly last for, for several minutes. Um, the signal is caused by uh, both the mass sliding down along the ground, but also rock bouncing off of each other. And um, this is a very characteristic frequency, uh, very characteristic signal. We see those commonly at volcanoes, which are steep and made of pretty crumbly rock and, and tend to fail uh, fairly frequently in small rock falls and avalanches. We also see helicopters. Um, helicopters are tourist magnet, uh, magnets, and uh, helicopters are, are zooming around there uh, fairly frequently. Um, this is a signal from a helicopter that was actually working, uh, helping us do our work at Mount St. Helens. And uh, so you can see uh, here's an approach. The, the helicopter is coming close in. It's, the signal's getting louder. And then it's hovering as it's coming down to land. And then uh, this phase over here is um, when the helicopter's on the ground, crews are unloading, so it's still idling. And then it takes off and off it goes. And uh, this is a picture of a helicopter that is doing just that for us at a site out near Mount Rainier, bringing in gear for us to install a seismic station. That's the kind of signal that it would create. We also see people and elk on the seismometers. These are very sensitive instruments, and if you're right up close to it, you can stomp around and make this kind of a signal. Uh, this is actually a, a family of elk that we're doing this right next to our seismometer. Not this particular family, but um, their uh, elk are all over the place at Mount St. Helens. So there's a lot of things that can happen to cause a noise on a seismometer, and um, it's, it's part of the job of the seismologist, the volcano seismologist, to look at those signals and kind of piece out what's going on uh, and, and come up with an interpretation. So all that being said, now we're gonna turn a little bit to what are the common warning signs that we see seismically of uh, an impending eruption. So the first thing is swarms of earthquakes. Um, earthquakes individually are not uncommon. Uh, most volcanoes have them. 
Um, but swarms are less common and particularly swarms that are numerous, talking about hundreds of earthquakes per day kind of a thing. When that kind of thing happens, um, your eyebrows are raised and you're paying attention a little more. Um, earthquake rates are increasing with time. So the number of earthquakes occurring, like there were 10 in hour one, 20 in hour two, 50 in hour three, 100 in hour four, that kind of trend um, is something that you definitely pay attention to. Earthquakes are increasing in size. So the earthquakes on day one were all magnitude less than one. Earthquakes on day two, they're all around magnitude two. Earthquakes on day three, there are threes. Um, that kind of increase uh, would, would uh, is, is all I look for. Um, and also to say earthquakes are fairly small at volcanoes. They don't usually get much above magnitude three or if you start seeing fours and fives, uh, that's, that's also a, a definite sign that something is probably coming up. Another thing that we look for is change in earthquake character from those volcano tectonic earthquakes that we showed, the sort of normal earthquakes, to the low frequency earthquakes that uh, may indicate some fluid or gas or magma is, is in, a, in a vibrating crack. Um, also tremor, that's not something that we commonly see in, in what we call background normal activity for a volcano. That's definitely a sign of unrest. And then finally, elk stampedes, which is just a joke. <clears throat> so what's going on with all these earthquakes is uh, this is a cross section uh, showing the top of a volcano. And then this is the magma feeder system going down at depth. So you can imagine this is probably like three or four miles down. This yellow area is the magma chamber. And if new magma comes up into this, um, there's this square that these next two figures over here to the right blow up and um, magma is coming in and it has to make room for itself. If there's more magma coming in, it has to make space. So it starts pushing against the walls on the outside of the magma chamber. And this final frame over here shows cracks that are coming out of or going, uh, that, that, are, that are in the, the rock surrounding the, the magma system and the, the, the rock is starting to break as it's making space. And all that breaking is causing earthquakes. And then as those cracks get bigger, the earthquakes get bigger, and you can start getting some fluids in there and start creating low frequency earthquakes. So mechanically, that's a kind of model that we have in our minds when we see earthquakes um, as a way of interpreting what might be going on. And uh, so finally, I just wanna give you a real life example of um, what a swarm looked like as it was building towards an eruption. These are a series of plots. We call these web recorder plots. Um, this is similar to what I showed you before. Uh, this is 12 hours of time from one seismic station. You read this like a book, left to right along one line. In this case, it's 15 minutes and top to bottom from uh, earliest to latest. It's again, 12 hours. Each one of these uh, uh, events, uh, these, these little squiggles here is an earthquake. The different colors are just for visualization. So the, the red line is um, no different than the blue line. It's just a different time. It's easier for us to, to, to keep things apart if they're colored differently. Um, and so you can see that earthquakes are occurring at a certain rate for this. And I should say, this is from uh, Volcan Huila in Colombia, 2008. Um, and so earthquakes are occurring at this, in this uh, particular instance at a rate of about one every one to two minutes. And we're gonna flash forward two days and uh, I'm gonna go back and forth. And hopefully you will agree with me when I will say that the earthquakes have gotten bigger uh, in the two days. Um, the earthquake rate is maybe the same, every, one every uh, one to two minutes, but the earthquakes have gotten bigger. So there's been one of those changes I mentioned before, the, the size has gotten bigger. And then four days later, after that first uh, web recorder I showed, now there's a lot more earthquakes and there are a lot more. So now we've got an increase in rate and we have an increase in size. And then six days later, this is what happened. Um, the earthquakes kind of stayed the same. Actually, there's a lot of little ones now that were occurring in amongst the big ones. So the earthquake rate actually went up quite a bit. And um, then that kind of built up to this explosion that lasted for about uh, 30 minutes. Um, so that, that's a, a pattern that, that uh, we often see, not 100% reliably. There's definitely uncertainty in all this and you can go wrong. Um, but those are the general patterns that, that we look for. So having all that in your background now, we're gonna go back to the scenarios. And uh, so gave you the scenario for day one and you all voted on that. Um, now we're gonna go to the next uh, day in the sequence, which is day three. So three days uh, into this. Um, earthquake rates have increased a little, but they've also fluctuated a bit. So they've increased and they've decreased and they've increased. Magnitudes of the events initially increased a bit, especially on that first day. Um, the largest was a magnitude two, but now they're decreasing. 
And there's not been any change in type of earthquake. All the earthquakes are volcano tectonic type still. And this still looks like a swarm that occurred at Mount Red Sock about a few years ago when no eruption occurred. So now we're going to go back to the poll, same set of options. Um, oops, before we do that, um, uh, this is the actual web recorder that you're looking at. This shows those three days of the, of the scenario. Um, so here's day one. This is when you walk into the office. You were all by yourself. There was the first earthquakes. And you can see over the next couple of days, earthquakes have increased in number. The earthquake rates increased. And you can also see that some of these um, earthquake signals are, uh, are darker. They're longer. Those are bigger earthquakes. And so they got bigger for a while. And then sort of towards the end of the third day, they kind of started tailing off. And, um, and this is where we're at right now, right here in the bottom right hand side. So that's where you are at right now. What is your call in terms of what, what do you think is going to happen, uh, with Mount Red Sock? And, uh, now we'll flip back over to that poll. And so again, the options are, um, harmless swarm, nothing to get excited about. No eruption likely, um, although it could happen. That would be the second one. Uh, third is eruption likely, but um, small and not for a couple of days. Third is a uh, fifth. Fourth is eruption is likely um, large, and uh, fifth is eruption is happening now. So we'll give you about a minute. Now the votes are coming in. Most folks are still thinking a harmless swarm, nothing to get excited about. Uh, an eruption in weeks is, is in seconds there. Mm -hmm. That was pretty close last time. The eruption in weeks was pretty close last time, too. All right. So give it another 10 seconds. Anybody who hasn't voted, you got 10 more seconds. All right. All right. Most folks thought harmless swarm. Well, so I've got, yeah, so it was 50, it was 43, 36, and 21. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to do one more day in this. And um, all right, do this, scroll through this. Okay. Day four in our scenario. Now, earthquake rates are increasing again. Magnitudes have increased significantly. Largest is now a magnitude 2.5. Starting to see low frequency earthquakes along with the volcano tectonic earthquakes. This has now lasted longer than any previous swarm from Mount Red Sox. And this is no longer looking like anything you've seen from Mount Red Sox since it last erupted 20 years ago. And this is what you're seeing now. So, uh, I get the pointer up. So here's the start, 2 a.m. on day one, and then the last point of the, the, the day three scenario ended over here when earthquakes were coming down. Right after that, earthquakes started getting bigger, and they started getting more numerous. You can see more little earthquakes occurring uh, in between the big ones, and then certainly by the end of day four, there's a lot more earthquakes occurring. And um, here's the change also. There's a vol um, volcanic tectonic earthquakes are mainly going on day one, day two, day three. But right around day four, we saw a change and started seeing low frequency earthquakes uh, as well. So we're going to do the poll one more time. What's your call now? And I'm going to pause for a minute to get that poll up and live. And... Okay, should be good. Okay, so we'll give you another minute.
right, so there's no more votes for harmless swarm now. At least not yet. All right, we'll give you another 10 seconds. And okay, we're going to go back. All right, so uh, a big change in the polling results. Um, nobody called that one a harmless swarm. And um, let me go now through what we thought. So this is actually not a swarm from Mount Red Sox, although I wish it was because I'm a Red Sox fan. But um, this is actually something that played out at Mount St. Helens in 2004. And uh, here is a weather quarter plot that shows actually 10 whole days going from 2 a.m on day one all the way down to day seven which is down here so we've been looking at uh, just these first uh, three days day one day three and day four this is the time period when uh, i was giving you the scenarios and this is how cvo the cascade volcano observatory called it um, so at the end of day one we issued an information statement that said this is a swarm um, there's a lot of earthquakes happening. We don't think this is leading to anything. So we didn't use the word harmless swarm, but we in essence said that. We didn't use the word likely eruption. We didn't actually, I don't think, use the word eruption at all in, the, in our information statement. Um, and at day three, it was looking like that was the right call, that earthquakes had started coming down and um, there wasn't really any need uh, to, to, uh, to do anything else besides uh, what we'd already done. Um, but day four, when uh, we started seeing this change in, I just did something, um, do I need to, there, okay. Um, sorry, my fault. Um, day four, when we saw this change in uh, earthquake character and we started seeing the earthquakes sort of the turn around and earthquakes starting to increase again or in, or in, increase in size. That was for us, um, outside the, 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 the realms of, of normal activity for, for St. Helens, and it looked to us much more at that point like it was likely that we were moving towards an eruption. Changed our color code to yellow. Yellow means an eruption is possible, not likely, but possible within uh, days to weeks to months. And this is also a time when you start looking at other kinds of information. And so we started going out to the volcano and uh, looking at what was happening on the ground and started seeing uh, visible signs of deformation. Um, that, along with the increases uh, you can see here on day five and day six, in terms of earthquakes getting bigger and much more numerous, finally compelled us to go to orange, which uh, by which we meant an eruption is likely within days. We said small, we didn't say large, and there's a variety of other reasons for that, not just seismic. Um, and the next day, uh, and so when we went to yellow, uh, that changed the ball game for us too. Our office, this is a picture of our office, and we had satellite trucks. Uh, the media were at our office 24 seven. This is a big story and it very quickly became a national story. Mount St. Helens is getting ready to erupt again. And so then uh, we were under a microscope and uh, all this built up to the first explosion, which was on October 4th, which is a, sort of a day after that whole weather quarter uh, that I showed you. So um, we basically agreed with, uh, with, with, with how you all called it. Uh, the first poll, um, it was sort of split 50-50 between harmless swarm and uh, going somewhere. And you all made that call with no training, with no understanding of what was going on. But that just seemed, I think, intuitively to be the right thing. You don't want to go right to eruption right away because um, A, there's not really good evidence for it, and B, you might cause some unnecessary panic at that point. You don't want to get people uh, unduly alarmed. Um, poll two, which was at the end of day three, um, that again was uh, mainly people were more, more tilted toward the harmless swarm. Um, there were one or two folks that thought that this was mainly was looking more like an eruption was likely, which as it turns out was actually what happened. Um, but where we were at was in agreement with most of you. We also thought this was still in the category of harmless swarm. Um, poll three, um, pretty, uh, pretty much everybody, nobody thought this was a harmless swarm anymore. There were some folks that were cautious and saying uh, this is likely, and a uh, majority of folks um, start saying it was possible but not likely, and then majority of folks uh, at that point uh, were saying that it was likely. We didn't 
go out and say likely right away. We said possible. Um, and that was partly a reflection of abundance of caution, of not wanting to uh, get ahead of things too fast. And also, we were looking for other signs. We were looking for gas coming out of the ground. We were looking for obvious ground cracks. We were, um, <clears throat> uh, it was Monday morning. We were trying to sort of get caught up as well. And um, the, uh, the, the sort of the proponents of those, uh, we didn't start seeing really compelling evidence that it was actually looking like it was going to move until the earthquakes got bigger, until we started seeing some really obvious signs that the, the crater floor itself was was moving at a fairly significant rate. Um, and, uh, and as it turned out, things, uh, the, the, the way that we called things worked fairly well with the Forest Service, with local emergency managers, and uh, with the media as well. Um, so that's the end of what uh, what I have, and uh, thank you all for listening, and be happy to take questions. All right, now you guys can um, you can send in your questions via the chat. So when you start uh, when you come up with some good questions to ask Seth here, just go ahead and, and type them in, and uh, and we'll respond. Um, what were you doing when this eruption was happening? I'll start out with a question. What were you doing? What was your life like at that time when this was all going on? Um, so, so uh, I was um, I came into the office at eight o'clock in the morning and, and saw those earthquakes, and that was sort of the the, the starting point for me. Um, I was a uh, I was a father of a, a three year old and a five year old, and uh, once we went to Yellow, um, I didn't come home very much. And weeks my wife brought them in one night to say goodnight in their pajamas which was sort of a sign that that this was actually fairly intense um but it, it was it was a it was a very um memorable experience it was a very charged experience i think the media presence was was uh was very uh intense and perhaps not something that all of us expected and uh the expectation of providing interpretations uh very fast um was something that um, scientists aren't really trained to do. We're trained to use the scientific method and be uh, somewhat careful about our steps and making sure we're not making mistakes along the way. And we didn't have the luxury of time with this event. Uh, it was it was evolving too fast, and so um, there there was a, a lot more a lot more speed involved in this. Well, it's exciting. Well, we've got um, Tukes Middle School wants to know when do you think Mount St. Helens will erupt again? Yeah, really good question. So from a geological perspective, Mount St. Helens is the most likely volcano to erupt again in the Cascades in our lifetime. And uh, since, so Mount St. Helens erupted in 2004 to 2008. And since 2008, um, we've seen very small, subtle signs that there is some magma, very small probably amount of magma that's been coming into the magma system um, and creating small earthquakes and creating a little bit of deformation. Um, what that looks like to us is that the volcano is uh, sort of recharging, but not on something that's going to be leading to eruption in days to weeks to months to years. It's probably something more like uh, decades um, that we'll, we'll see it erupt again. And it'll probably erupt in a similar way to what it did in 2004, 2008, uh, which, was, which was what we call a lava dome building eruption. It was uh, not very explosive. All the stuff that came out was contained within the crater. So there was no hazards really posed to anybody outside of the crater. And that's been the history of Mount St. Helens. Um, when it erupts, um, it, uh, it, like it does in 1980, um, where it, it really destroys itself, the next several centuries, it spends most of its time rebuilding itself. And uh, so that that's the kind of thing that we would expect to see. And we have a fairly good understanding of the signs of uh, eruptions like what happened in 2004, the kind of stuff that we would see with earthquakes, with deformation, that would tell us that that kind of eruption is going to be happening. And so what we're seeing right now is, is very consistent with what we were seeing um, before 2004, actually, where we thought sort of a similar kind of thing. So um, the Huskies from Bainbridge Island uh, want to know, wouldn't you have seen a big bulge in the mountain before this eruption? Um, that was, uh, so uh, the, the question is, we've seen a bulge. Um, and that's definitely a good expectation. Um, it turned out with the 2004 eruption that the volcano itself, the outside of the volcano, 
didn't really move that much. Um, and then there were some instruments on the side of the volcano that are, that are very sensitive and they didn't see much of anything. The only place that we saw really concentrated deformation was right in the crater itself, right on the old lava dome, which was basically getting pushed away at, out of the way as, as the new stuff was coming in. Um, and so that, that, in order to see that, we had to be very, very close to um, the dome itself. Um, but that basic question, would we see some kind of uh, 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 expanding outwards um, is, is exactly the point. And that's why we have uh, GPS measurements. We have instruments that are capable of measuring that kind of deformation, which is very, very small on the order of uh, less than an inch. That's the kind of precision that we're trying to measure to detect that. It's not something that you would be able to see. Certainly with 1980, um, the, when, when that eruption got going, um, in the months leading up to May 18, there was a bulge and the bulge was moving outwards at the rate of several feet a day. Um, that, that, um, that's not normal and that's not what we normally, uh, are looking for. We're looking for much, much smaller ground motions that would tell us about, about, about small things. Let's see, a couple more questions here. Um... So you were talking about the volcanic history. A uh, school from Carmichael, California, wants to know how many eruptions have happened since 1950. Okay, so um, eruptions that have, that have happened at Mount St. Helens since 1950s, um, 1980 and 2004. And 1980 had, uh, we, we actually think of 1980 through 86 as an, uh, an eruption or an eruptive time period. There were 20 total eruptions during that time frame. Um, they were separated by by months at most, and so sort of broadly viewed as being one continuous eruption with some pauses. And some of the pauses lasted for months. In one case, it lasted for half a year. Um, and then 2004 to 2008, that was one continuous eruption that lasted for three and a half years. So I, I think most geologists would answer that question that it's erupted twice uh, since the 1950s. We've got Amboy Middle School. They'd like to know what signs you need to see before you let the public know of any activity. What does it take for you to, to make a, a statement? So anytime there's something that we see um, is a little bit out of the ordinary, we issue, we, we, make some, we make statements, and we do that in a couple of different ways. So we have a weekly update, um, which we uh, uh, put out once, once a week, every Friday, for all the volcanoes in the Cascades. And if there's some interesting seismic signal of note that happened during that week, we'll mention it in that update. Um, if there's activity that has, is happening that is um, interesting enough that we think we should put out something um, more specifically, like an information statement, um, then, then we'll do that. I should also say that we have um, the data, and, and by we, I should say the Cascade Volcano Observatory, but also University of Washington, Pacific Northwest Seismic Seismograph Network. Um, if you go to www.pnsn.org, they have all of the seismic data from all the stations around the states of Washington and Oregon displayed in real time. You can go there and look at the kinds of plots I showed, these web recorder plots. Um, so the data, the recordings of, of what's happening at the volcanoes are there for anybody to see. Um, so that's in a way uh, a, a way of releasing information. There's no interpretation that comes with that. Um, the interpretation, when we decide it's time to bring in, um, uh, to, 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 to make interpretations, it's when things have risen outside of what we would consider to be, consider to be background normal activity. You know, we've got so many questions here and I imagine some schools might need to go. We're gonna keep answering these and um, we're recording all of this too, Go back and watch this later on if you'd like to hear some more questions and answers. So just so you know, you're not going to miss it all. You can always come back and check it out later. Um, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Is anything that I've skipped over? Oh, um, how do seismographs work? That's a pretty cool question. Also, how stressful is it to be a seismologist? Well, I'm smiling, so it's not it's not tremendously. Um, so a, a, a seismograph works. Um, there, there, there's sophisticated electronics that are involved in what we're putting out uh, today, but um, the essence of it is that the, 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 the seismometer uh, has a case, like a Coke can, the, 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 what I'm calling the cases, the outsides of the Coke can. You bury that in the ground, 
When the ground moves, the case moves with that. Inside the case is a, um, is a, a spring with a mass, a magnetic mass that's hanging at the bottom of that spring. And um, so when the ground moves, the spring gives a little bit of a buffering and the mass basically doesn't move. And what we measure is the difference in position between the casing and the mass. So when the ground's not moving, the mass isn't moving. When the ground moves and the casing moves, the mass stays behind and there's relative motion between the two. And um, the way that that is recorded is uh, inside the casing, attached to the casing, is a whole bunch of co uh, coiled copper wire. And the magnet's passing through the copper wire. And a, a rule, a, a law of physics is that when you pass a magnet through a conducting medium like copper, you induce a current. It's a very short lived current. And that current is what we measure, is what we use that goes out uh, into our radios and gets broadcast out. And the current, uh, the strength of the current tells us something about how much the ground has moved. Um, so that's probably a more technical answer for. Uh, it's a pretty cool trick. Way back when in the uh, uh, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, when um, largely the, the uh, Chinese and Japanese were interested in this because they were having earthquakes a lot, um, they uh, did experiments with paper and pencils, and the pencil was attached to a, uh, uh, to a mass with a spring. And uh, one of the problems with that is that there's friction with the, the paper and the pencil, and the friction damped out the pencil after a while, so you didn't really get a good recording. So people have been thinking about how do you do this uh, for a long time, centuries and centuries, and this uh, magnet and copper coil thing is 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 the cool answer, or one cool answer. Wow, that's really neat. And so is it stressful to be a seismologist, would you say? Um, th there are times when it's stressful to be a seismologist. I, I, the thing um, about seismology, it's about earthquakes, is that you can't predict when they're going to happen. So you don't know if on any given day uh, if you're going to be having to deal with something. Um, the nice thing about being a volcano seismologist is that you get a little more warning about an eruption happening. But that eruption largely comes in the form of, of earthquakes. And so uh, in some ways, the seismologist is the first responder. I don't want to overstate that too much. but um, uh, that that's uh, oftentimes the, seism the seismologist is the first one to recognize that something's happening. Uh, let's see, Amboy Middle School wants to know, what signs do you need to see before you let the public know of any activity? So the signs that we uh, see, I mean, we have gotten better about letting the public see what we're seeing. And so part of the answer is, again, that anybody can go online and look at seismic data. Um, and look at and look and look at wiggles and make their own uh, interpretations. Um, we we try to walk this tightrope of not unnecessarily alarming people, and we're very cognizant of the fact that if we make some kind of a statement, that will be noticed. And so um, we don't want to sort of go there unless it's it's important. And I guess as as one example. Mount Rainier, there's a lot of attention being paid, has been paid to the possibility of a landslide triggered lahar going down into the Puyallup River Valley where there's the towns of Ording and Sumner and um, Puyallup that are, uh, that are built on lahar deposits from, um, from past large landslides. One happened 500, uh, 560 years ago. So um, with Mount Rainier, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of, of awareness now of that possibility. Um, and so uh, with um, swarms at Mount Rainier, which do happen, um, we, we, we wait for a while to make sure that um, what's happening is really warranting putting out an official statement. But we can, uh, we have other ways of doing it, uh, of, of letting the public know that don't rise to the official level and might not trigger that sort of an, an overreaction in some fashion. Um, and that includes these weekly updates. Uh, we have a hot stuff a box on our webpage where we can put, um, hey, there's something happening at Mount Rainier right now. I just want you, just want to let you know, which is not an official pronouncement, but it's a, it's a place where people can go. Let's see, we've got another question from uh, the Huskies in Bainbridge Island. Um, they want to know how loud was the 2004 eruption? Did people hear it? So the 2000 eruption was mostly a dome building eruption. I'm guessing that uh, the, the question is about the explosion, that first explosion uh, that I showed at the very end. And um, 
it, no, it was not very loud, and it, it looks like it, it looks like it could have been. Um, I, I was out with a crew. We were trying to install a seismometer, and we were about mm, two and a half miles away. We were not in the crater; we were outside the crater, and um, the it was actually silent. We didn't hear a thing. Uh, the only way we knew about it is we turned around and saw this cloud going up. Um, so uh, that that and that actually is often often the case with explosions is that it's really variable as far as whether you hear them or not. And we actually have instruments out there that um, are, are are basically microphones that are listening for uh, that, that are there to record airwaves, um, not airwaves that we would hear necessarily, but airwaves that are created by something that disturbs the atmosphere. Um, and those can be quite variable as well as far as whether they pick it up. It matters you know, a lot of heat. If there's a mountain in the way, um, those kinds of things can really impact it. Um, with 1980. May 18, 1980, the big, the big explosion. Um, people up close heard it very strongly. Then there was this area about 40, 50 miles um, uh, wide uh, away from the volcano. So it was going, starting about uh, 25 miles, going out to about 75, 80 miles where people didn't hear it. And uh, the idea behind that was that the uh, sound waves basically went up into the atmosphere and kind of skipped over this, that part of the land. And then they bounced off the atmosphere and came back down. And people in Seattle heard it. Um, so there's some, some variability in that as well. So you were two miles from the volcano when it erupted. Was that a stressful time to be a <laughs> seismologist? So, um, so yeah. So, so when on, on October 1st, when there was that first explosion, and we were we were two miles away. Um, before we went out there, we did a risk analysis, and uh, we um, folded into the the risk analysis what. Um, the observatory was saying was most likely to happen, which is what we believe, which was most likely, most likely to happen. We didn't think there was going to be a really big eruption um, if it erupted. And uh, we thought that if sort of the worst case scenario came to be, um, where we were was an okay place, not perhaps great, but an okay place, a survivable place. And also part of our risk analysis was that we had a helicopter um, that was that was with us. And the first sign of anything happening we were evacuating ourselves, and that's what happened. So uh, as soon as we saw that cloud, we we, uh, we got the helicopter going and uh, and got ourselves out. Let's see another question here um, from Eric. Can you use depth monitoring as a way uh, as an indicator for an eruption? I'm not sure what depth monitoring uh, what's meant by depth monitoring. Um, I, I I will uh, I, I will take a take a take a whack at that. Um, the uh, one thing that uh, people do look for is a change in depth with earthquakes, um, that earthquakes would start deeper and start becoming shallower with time as magma makes its way up to the surface. Um, and that kind of thing to look for. It's difficult to see, um, <clears throat> or it's proven to be difficult to see, because as earthquakes get closer and closer to the, to the surface, Unless you have a seismometer right on top of the earthquakes, it can be very difficult to determine depths, um, and that has to do with the triangulation. Um, and by determine depths, I don't mean we can't do it. I mean we can't tell the difference between one that's at zero miles down and one that's a half mile down and one that's one, one mile down. The differences between those in terms of how you record them on earthquakes on, on seismometers that are a couple miles away, and there's not a lot, not enough difference to really be able to precisely nail that down. So it, it turns out to be very, very important to have seismometers right on top of the volcano, right on top of the vent. And if you have that, then there is a chance that you can start doing that kind of depth monitoring and looking for shallowing of hypocenters or so shallowing of, of earthquake depths. Um, how much magma comes into the magma chamber per year? So how much magma comes into the magma chamber per year? Good question. So um, that's actually a, a, a sort of a, 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 phenom a, a phenomenological question for, for volcanologists. Um, there's two beliefs or two, I guess, models. Um, one is that it's a steady trickle that comes in continuously over time. The other is that it comes in discrete batches, and in between those, in between those, uh, in between the batches, uh, there's nothing that's coming into the system. Um, we're, as a field, as a field of volcanology, we're still fairly new at being able to um, uh, to, to detect signs that magma is coming in. And again, it can be very subtle. The signs, if, if magma is coming in at 8, 10 miles um, below the surface, um, the amount of room it has to make for itself, by the time that is 
uh, you know, brought up to the surface, it's very, very small ground motions that, that we would measure at the surface. And so that, that can be very hard to see. Also, earthquakes don't tend to occur below depths of six or so miles uh, because the earth is too warm and uh, you don't get the kind of brittle failure that you need for an earthquake. Um, so we don't necessarily see earthquakes when magma is moving upwards. So we don't really have a good way of, of, of measuring at many volcanoes. At St. Helens, um, I think as a general statement, uh, people would say it's probably more along the lines of a steady trickle that's uh, that's coming in there, and that's based on some of the signs that, we're, that we've been seeing since 2008. There's just some earthquakes that are um, giving us indications that there's some magma coming in. There's some small deformation signals that, that we're seeing that are continuous. Um, so, you know, that that's the defamations uh, started happening in 2008. It's still happening now. It's very, very, very small. Um, so th there are signs that there is some kind of steady small amount of magma that's coming in. And in that way of thinking, um, you can sort of think of it as just maybe not the best, best analogy, but there's a balloon. The balloon needs to get filled up to a certain point, And once it gets to that point, then you have a situation where the volcano can erupt again. It's eruptible. Um, and so part of the statement I made before about we don't think this is leading to an eruption tomorrow or even years from now, we're looking at uh, eruption probably in the order of decades from now uh, at St. Helens again. That's based on this idea that we need to build things up a little bit before we're, we're really ready to erupt, have, another, have another eruption again. Question from another question from Carmichael, California. What was the most explosive volcano that has been uh, recorded since we've had um, uh, you know, technology for, for yeah. seismology? So what was the most explosive eruption that's occurred since we've been monitoring things? Um, really good question. And um, I think, I think this is still true. The largest, largest eruption that's happened in the last, uh, si since St. Helens, 1980, was 1991 uh, Mount Pinatubo. Um, and that, that was actually quite a bit larger than Mount St. Helens. Um, that had a seismic network on it. It was not a very good one. Um, and it was uh, put together uh, after the first uh, real precursories, uh, precursory signals uh, started happening. So there, so there was some, uh, some stuff that was missed. Um, but that that's probably the biggest one that's been caught uh, to date by by people. And this is you know this is uh, monitoring. Um, we're at a point now where we know what we need to do in order to have good monitoring, but we're very far away from being able to do it in a lot of places. Volcanoes are very remote. Um, a lot of the volcanoes in uh, the in in the, in the Cascades in Alaska are uh, have very harsh winter conditions, and so getting uh, while the winter is happening is is very challenging, um, and it's also a resource issue. Um, there's countries like Indonesia, which have hundreds of volcanoes that uh, potentially could erupt, um, and uh, having the resources to cover them all with the kind of equipment that we know you need to have is, is a very, very tall order. Um, so we're still at a point where there's a lot of volcanoes that have eruptions um, that aren't that well recorded, and uh, that's just something that um, hopefully with time, uh, we'll we'll get a little bit better. All right. Well, we've got two questions left, um, and they're kind of related. They're from Tukes Middle School. Uh, how many earthquakes happen on Mount St. Helens per day, and how far away could the earthquakes from the 1980 eruption be felt? Wow, good question. Okay, so uh, first question with how many earthquakes happen at Mount St. Helens per day. Um, the, the background rate for St. Helens is around a couple a day, um, and that's one of the highest background rates of the volcanoes in the Cascade that we monitor. Um, within that, there's a lot of variability. Um, some days there aren't any, other days there's more than a couple. Um, and again, with St. Helens, uh, what we look for is not those individual uh, small ones that are sort of going boop, and then a couple hours later, another boop. We're looking for ones that have, uh, that, that lead, that, that start becoming swarms, where you start, they start stacking up on top of each other. Um, as far as how far away could the earthquakes from 1980 be felt, the largest one was they were in the order of magnitude five. So uh, you can feel a five a long ways away. Um, you could feel them down in Vancouver. Uh, that's a, that's a definitely a feelable earthquake uh, in in Portland, Vancouver, and um, uh, and and up up to uh, uh, um, um, Longview, 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 Calcio. Calcio. I'm sorry, um, and and not quite Olympia, probably not uh, not that far up, um, <clears throat> and. 
the uh, the the eruption itself, the May 18 eruption, um, there that that started with a landslide, and there was a large seismic signal with that landslide that recorded as an earthquake. And there's been a debate uh, for uh, since May 18, 1980, about whether the landslide started off as an earthquake or if what we saw was the landslide was the earthquake. Either way, that was about a 5.7, 5.8, and uh, and that definitely uh, was 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 felt um, a long distance away. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Great to have you here today, Seth. It was wonderful uh, hearing your story. Thanks for answering all those questions, and thank all of you out there for uh, taking part uh, in Volcano Explorers. We're going to do another one in a month from now on November 21st. Um, with Dan Zerson from uh, from USGS as well. Um, and before you go, I just want to encourage you to, to fill out that survey before you leave. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Take care. Thanks, everyone.